Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for joining today. And so on the occasion of Teacher's Day, I'll be discussing about how the Bhagavad Gita demonstrates Krishna as an expert teacher. And we'll be having this in two-part session. So we'll also be going over the Bhagavad Gita. So to understand Krishna's teaching expertise, we will be doing this in three broad ways. There'll be a, I'll be using this as a whiteboard to write things. So there will be a textual flow and analysis that we'll be doing. That means what is the Gita and what is the Gita teaching? That we'll be discussing. And through that we'll discuss uh, while we are going over the 18 chapters, we'll be discussing also mm, what are the needs of the, situa of the student in that situation and how they are addressed. So that is where that expertise in teaching comes up. And another thing we'll be discussing that the teaching can be driven in two ways. That one is the student has a particular need to know and the teacher addresses that need. But there's another aspect to teaching. There is the purposes of the teacher and how they are being pursued. So both are important. Sometimes the purpose of the teacher has to be emphasized. So whereby actually over the, over the, as we say, the teacher has to have a lesson plan or over the flow, the teacher started, okay, this is what I wanted to teach and this is what I have been able to teach. But the teacher's plan of the per plan and purpose should not be so domineering or overriding that if the student has some genuine needs, concerns, interests, they're not at risk. So all these three we'll be analyzing to explore how Krishna is an expert teacher. And overall, will be, because the Gita is fairly long, the Gita has 18 chapters and it has 700 verses within it. So it's not super long in terms of the narrative. It is uh, actually something which can be spoken by somebody who's fluent in Sanskrit within, within an hour or two, depending on the fluency of the speech. But the point is, it, the concepts are many. So we're not going to go into all the concepts, but within the Gita's flow, we will pause at particular points and we will be emphasizing those points and analyzing Krishna's teaching expertise through those points. So I, I, I will cover about, depending on time, I will try to cover five, six or seven points totally in uh, this session as well as the session next week. And broadly, these will be centered on an acronym, teach. So either I'll cover five points or I'll go on to seven points, depending on how much, how the flow goes. And we will, towards the end, have a brief time for question answers also. So let's begin. The first P is timing. There is a fundamental difference between, say, education that is, say, given to children and that, that is which is given to adults. So for children, often the education is to some extent an obligation. The children, that's what they do. They learn. They go to school. In fact, learning is like the, their full-time job. They don't have a job in the, in the normal sense of the word. But it's an obligation. You have to go to school and you have to study. But for adults, largely the education is based on relevance. You know, once a person is settled in life, 
does this really add value to my life is this really necessary for me to learn it's only when the necessity is felt that is the time when the learning becomes effective otherwise if there's a there might be a lot of wisdom available and even provided but if it is not considered valuable if it is not considered relevant then when it is taught it will not be of much effect so let's see now the bhagavad gita's education is largely in terms of adult education krishna and arjuna are both adults and because they are adults and it is not that arjuna at this stage is a gurukul or any kind of educational system where he has to learn so while this particular principle applies especially for ongoing learning among adults but this principle of relevance is something which can increase both the it increases the interest and the impact of the learning when it is seen as relevant it is seen as something which is needed for the person otherwise it just becomes a ritual that has to be followed it has to be done let's do it so quite often as relevance is associated with timing generally whenever you see relevant that means it is it applies to the time that a person is in is this relevant for me if, uh, if we are studying a book which is 5000 years old is that relevant for me now well the bhagavad gita is relevant because we are discussing here not just the teaching so when you talk about gita we could be discussing its teachings but you can also be discussing its mode of teaching and we are focusing more in our session on the mode of teaching this is our greater emphasis and we will be discussing the teachings a little bit to the extent that understanding is valuable for looking at the mode of teaching but both of these are universal the teachings are universal and they are the mode of teaching that is you that is also universal that's why you can say it is universally relevant it is something which is vital at all times vital and valuable at all times so let's begin with a look at the narrative structure of the gita the, the bhagavad gita as i said has 18 chapters and its beginning because the chapter 1 begins that has because the chapter 1 it has 46 texts and then if you go to chapter 2 it goes on till it has 72 texts but text i mean verses over there so it is not that krishna goes there into the bhagavad gita into the kurukshetra battlefield with the intention to speak the bhagavad gita not as arjuna go there with the intention to learn the bhagavad gita so what happens is that arjuna is ready to fight a war but somehow when he has to fight a war he can start getting second thoughts should i be fighting or should i not be fighting and when he has this question there are lots of different kinds of things that we could learn from our education mm-hmm. the in the philosophy of education there is often a question what is the purpose of education mm-hmm. so quite often education is associated with means of living in fact that is the primary understanding of the purpose of education that it is okay you get take this particular job you choose this particular career because then you can you can earn a good living now if you learn 
the, if you learn engineering, you learn medicine, you learn law, then you have means of living. And that is a valuable purpose. But a far more important purpose of education is meaning of living. And so this, you could say, is more associated with skills. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is associated more with values. You know, what brings value to our life? So means of living, it is more about getting things of value. We can, suppose we get a, some vocational education and through that we can earn some living, we can get this, we can get that, we can earn some money. That's fair enough. But, but meanings of living, it is getting value of things. Now by things, I'm not really using their objects only, but in general, there are various things in life, you know, and which things are of how much value? Uh, what is more valuable? What is most valuable? We place the various things in a hierarchy of value. So that is about meaning of living. So that is what is the crisis that Arjuna faces right at the start of the Gita. What happens is when Arjuna is about to face uh, the opponents, he is going to use the means of living, that is archery. And he is expert at archery. But it, it's not that suddenly he forgets how to use a bow and arrow. Rather, he has second thoughts about whether he should be using the bow and arrow at all. So what is the reason for Arjuna's crisis? Arjuna's dilemma, it is associated with a crisis of value. He's being pulled by two duties. He comes ready to do his Kshatriya Dharma. Kshatriya Dharma is that he's a, he's a martial guardian of society. And as per the Kshatriya Dharma, he should be fight. He should be fighting against aggressors. And the opposite side have been brutal, repeated aggressors. And that's how he comes in. This first part will be a little conceptual because we need to understand to some extent what the Gita is teaching before we can understand how it is teaching. So till about from 1.14 when we are introduced to Arjuna, Till 1.19, Arjuna is quite fixed in his idea that, that he has to do Kshatriya Dharma. He blows his conch and everybody else follows the lead. And they're all very confident and ready to fight. But then from 1.20, this is all the first chapter going on. From 1.20 onwards, he starts thinking of the Kula Dharma. And by 1.46, Kuladharma he says, he feels that if I, the, all the opponents, they are members of my dynasty. So the, I feel that he should not fight against his relatives. So when he is having this dilemma, should he fight? Should he not fight? So in one sense, if you consider the narrative flow of the first chapter, if we considered, say, a weighing scale, then in Arjuna's eyes, initially, or Arjuna's mind, you can say, he begins with the Kshatriya Dharma being higher. Uh, the Actually, so the Kshatkula Dharma is not that important. He knows about it. The Kshatriya Dharma is higher in his mind. This is what I am meant to do. But this is the situation in one point till 1.1920. But then within his mind itself, his priority changes. And he starts feeling these are my relatives. How can I fight against them? So the weighing scale balance changes. And he starts thinking that the Kula Dharma is much, much more important than the 
kshatriya dharma and when he starts thinking like that that's when he starts feeling maybe i should not fight and that is where arjuna starts saying oh i should not be fighting maybe now when he starts thinking i should not be fighting what exactly happens by this when he starts thinking i should not be fighting the result of this is that he tells arjuna visrujya sacharam chapam shoka samvigna manasah so he says i will i will not fight he puts aside his bow now one of the key principles in education especially in adult education is that one needs to teach at the right moment so if you see throughout the first chapter the dynamic of the krishna arjuna relationship is that basically they are friends mm -hmm. within that hierarchy arjuna is the warrior krishna is a charioteer so we could even say that arjuna is at a higher position in the hierarchy now we get friend friend and friend they are equal as a warrior and charioteer the warrior is higher so krishna doesn't speak much so generally when we are trying to give counseling to people then till they seek answers our giving answers to them will not be very helpful if they think that they already know then if then sometimes we just need to let them speak so the first point is timing means when does krishna start speaking the so krishna goes along with arjuna initially it throughout the first chapter krishna just speaks one fourth of a verse in 125 and then he just speaks two verses in 2.2 and 3 he is not talking much at all initially krishna arjuna tells krishna sena yor bhai aur madhye ratham sthapai me achuta take my chariot in between the two armies i want to see who is there and krishna says okay fine uva cha parth pashyatan samavetan kuruniti parth pashyatan just is half a verse that krishna speaks over here so here his speech is mostly descriptive okay want to see now see them over there see bhishma and drona and then in second chapter 2.2 and 3 when krishna is speaking krishna is speaking more in an exhortative mood rather than an instructive or educative mood exhorted him as a friend he said was a friend but come on you know don't be weak like this don't give in to nerves you are tough man come on fight that's the mood because when the two of them are discussing we have to wait till the other person is ready to listen now as arjuna keeps hearing i talking about this weighing scale arjuna is initially thinking that kshatriya dharma is definitely superior then he starts thinking kula dharma is superior but then as he keeps thinking he starts realizing actually i don't know i don't really know which is better is fighting better or is fighting but not fighting better and it is at this point where he comes in 2.6 and here he is confused and is here that he surrenders so where whereas krishna and arjuna had a friendly relationship in 2.7 arjuna voluntarily becomes a student a disciple and he accepts krishna as his guru now when we are guiding someone we may not necessarily expect the other person to come to a situation where they formally accept us as a guru but sometimes we need to wait till they are actually asking questions not just making an argument so we make an argument they make an argument sometimes we don't have to point out to them 
the hollowness of their arguments they might be making some points but people in general are not foolish life is tough and anybody who has survived through life live alone thrived at any level in life they have a certain level of intelligence so now of course we can say everybody has more to learn and that is definitely true but we need to the timing point refers to that krishna gives arjuna time to come to a learning mood so some now arjuna we could say krishna right in the beginning could have snapped arjuna out of his confusion and delusion given him an instruction and arjuna was in tears arjuna, at 2.1 tandatha krupaya vishtam ashrupurna kulekshanam arjuna was in tears in 2.1 now krishna could have said why should i my friend be subjected to tears like this yes that is true naturally but sometimes those tears and the agony that they represent were necessary for arjuna to come to a point where he could actually value what was to be learned so timing is important when do we speak about something to someone everybody is going through their own evolutionary process process in life and especially when we want to teach some values if we are observing them keenly then we can understand okay this is a good time and that means a time when they are become aware of the inadequacies of what they know the timing is that everybody has some knowledge in some ways humility means that there are all we all have things we know and we all have things we don't know so we all come to a life point when we start valuing the things we don't know more than the things we know hey maybe i don't know how to deal with this so if we could come to that point or we could wait for that person to come to that point and then speak that is the time when they can they'll be the most receptive to learn now while this is not always possible but keeping this in mind will ensure that we can have the maximum interest and the maximum impact when we speak so in one sense as i said the gita has 700 verses and out of that 46 verses are in the first chapter so it is not a small portion krishna does not speak for almost 1/12th of the gita he waits it like if you have a one hour session or a 70 minute session you know krishna is letting arjuna speak for 7 8 9 10 minutes mm-hmm. till he speaks till krishna starts speaking so that's the first point about timing you now wait for the person to come to a place where they recognize that they need to know and they are in a learning mood especially when we are educating adults or when you get children who are coming to adulthood they sometimes just harping on something which they are not doing right only alienates them but when they themselves realize they are confused and then they turn then we will have far more desirable e- effect that was the first point p hmm. then e is the is expansion expansion means that when we are trying to explain something there are two broad ways of teaching now it's like say the student is here the teacher is here now the student knows something the teacher knows something much more hmm? so now the teacher could say that 
all that you know is wrong hmm? and you just put aside everything and you will i'll teach you what i know so it could be a rejection of what the student knows or it could be a building up on what the student knows okay this is what you know i'll teach you something more now and this approach of building up expanding on what the teacher knows or on what the student knows this is far more effective now in one sense this is implicit in our education that say when a student goes from level 1 to level 2 so they learned something in english and maybe they learned basic alphabet they learned now they learn some words now they learn some grammar they learn some figures of speech they learn complex sentence structures so that is natural in one sense so there's letters words grammar like that it goes on so it's a normal building up now that is natural but quite often when some teachers teach their concern is emphasizing how what the students know is wrong how it is useless and this it is quite possible that sometimes what the student know is wrong that is also a for part of education so for example in 3 minus 5 you might be told not possible but later on 3 minus 5 is told it's it's possible as minus 2 so now sometimes between a lower level of education and a higher level of education there might be contradiction also and if we tell the student that okay what you learned till now is all wrong that creates a disorientation that creates insecurity that creates a lack of uh, that don't creates a lack of confidence but that creates a fear like what am i doing with my life and this is especially necessary when we are talking about not just the means of living but the meaning of living everybody has formed some world view and when we are going to tell them something more beyond that world view then we could say oh your false previous world view is all wrong and i will give you the next a uh, right world view so krishna does not have that attitude although in one sense there could be a contradiction so krishna does start with arjuna is starting with bodily consciousness mm-hmm. and he is saying these are my relatives how can i kill them and one of krishna's fundamental teachings in the very first teaching section in the bhagavad gita 2.11 to 30 is to infuse spiritual consciousness that the core of our being is spiritual we are not this our physical side we are our core at our core indestructible spiritual beings now krishna does emphasize that but while emphasizing that what does krishna do krishna does not reject arjuna's concerns it's not even say that oh you know you are a ignorant fool uh, for being concerned about people's bodies no is even after we understand we are the soul does that mean that we don't care for anyone's body at all no there is caring for others is natural and if we have bodily consciousness then we care for the body and that is what arjuna was exhibiting in chapter 1 now when we have spiritual consciousness then we care for 
more than the body not that we don't care for the body at all so krishna acknowledges arjuna's concerns but krishna builds on those concerns this, this is especially from 2.11 till the entire first chapter 2.53 how is krishna building on arjuna's concerns krishna is telling yes you are concerned about bhishma that's good that concern is valid but who is bhishma really who is drona really they are your grandparents they are your they, they, they is your grandfather is your teacher but at their essence they are spiritual beings they are souls and krishna what he what he implies especially the one verse the critical 222 you can see the flow of the gita this 222 it gives the example of the body is like the dress the clothes we wear and the soul is like the person wearing that dress and what does he say is that and when a person when the person the person clothes become old they take on new clothes so similarly a person gives up their body and takes up a new body so essentially is saying alternating arjuna that those whom you care for they are not going to be killed only they are okay they will lose their body but they will get a better body in the future because they are virtuous beings so basically see then there are concerns which arjuna has and then there are strategies that arjuna is using to address those concerns so from our concern address the strategy arise the strategies so what krishna is not dismissing arjuna's concerns the concern is caring for others so based on arjuna's understanding krishna is telling arjuna was thinking initially the strategy should be don't fight because <coughs> if i fight i should be i'll be killing them but krishna says that same concern is valid no doubt the concern is still the same but the strategy with the knowledge of atma gyan it becomes different the strategy becomes fight to elevate them so the same concern caring for others is still there it's not gone but caring for others with krishna knowledge means it is caring for their souls primarily so in general we need to build on what people know rather than dismissing or deriding what they know we need to build on what they know that way when it's an expansion of their knowledge now when when what we give them builds on what they know then they feel they feel reassured they also feel equipped they also feel empowered yeah i am learning something new now even if this means emphasizing that what they knew was wrong sometimes that has to be emphasized but that shouldn't be our sole emphasis the world is a tough place and when we are uh, equipping people we'll come to this uh, education uh, later on again in the future toward the end of our course that is the last session but um, the <clears throat> what people need is wisdom knowledge you can say in education but a good teacher also needs to give the confidence to people that you can learn this okay this is what you need to learn there is a content of learning wisdom is the content of learning this is what you need to learn but along with the content of learning the content to learn there is a confidence to learn that is required if that con confidence to learn is not given then what happens is people may get the content but they may feel this is too complicated i cannot get this and they might just abandon everything 
So education has to be always built on a ethos of expansion. And Krishna himself both demonstrates and articulates this principle. Krishna demonstrates in, the, in chapter 2, as I said, that build on people's existing knowledge. But then he himself articulates this principle in the third chapter in 22nd verse, where he says that na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidwan yuktah samacharan. He says that, that he basically talks about two levels of people. The first level of people are those who are wise and detached. Vidwan and Yuktaha. And then the other are ignorant, avidwan, and asaktaha. They are attached. And even when there is to be instruction given from somebody at this level to this level, Krishna says that don't disturb their minds. Don't disturb them. Na buddhi bhedam janayet. So why not disturb them? Because uh, if we disturb them, they might just lose their confidence. He says, Joshayet Sarva Karmani. So instead he says, don't disturb, engage appropriately. Engage in a way that they can be elevated. So let's illustrate this uh, with a concluding example, this particular principle before we Move to the next principle. The idea is, uh, suppose somebody is coming to a temple mm, to visit a physical temple. And say, when they come to the temple, you know, there is a giant cliff which they have to, from here, they have to take a high jump to come over here. Mm. Or they have to crawl with their hands and legs. And then somehow they have to come up over here. Now, most people, they will either not try to go up or they will jump up and they will just fall down and injure themselves. So if people actually, if the, those who are constructing the temple, if they want people to come to the temple, then what they will do is they will actually create steps. Okay, this is where you are at. You yeah, take one step up. Take another step up. Take another step up. Take another step up. Take another step up and gradually you will reach where you are needed. So that way, the step-by-step -step approach this is where you are. You take you forward from there. So expansion. Expansion means okay, you go up from here to here, from here to here like that. You keep moving forward up. So the step-by-step -step approach is something which works much better. So build on what people know. Don't demonize it, deride what they know to take it forward. Knowledge grows by ex knowledge grows best by expansion, not by demonization, deride, derision, or dismissal. So Krishna recognizes that Arjuna is also an intelligent person. And what Arjuna knows, take it forward from there. Then after that, when he's moving forward, I'll talk about the third principle today and then we'll have some questions and the remaining we'll talk in the next session. So A, is a pre Appreciation. Now, appreciation means what? That when a person has some questions, at that time, how we address those questions is vital for that person's confidence in learning and growing. Suppose somebody asks a question and he says, that's a stupid question. 
Now only a fool would ask a question like this. Then not only will that person never ask questions again, but nobody else will ask questions after that. Why? Because people don't want. Nobody wants to be made to be feel wrong or fool, wrong or foolish. They need to be appreciated. Yeah, that's a good question. So this is especially seen in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So we are jumping forward a little bit. We will address some of the points we are mentioned in the third, fourth, fifth chapters also at a later time in the Bhagavad Gita. But here, in the Gita's flow, as I mentioned, there are eighteen chapters, but there are seventeen questions that are asked by Arjuna. Hmm? Arjuna asks seventeen questions, and he asks in chapter two there are two questions in chapter three there are chapter three also there are two questions this is two three in chapter four there is one question in chapter five there is one question in chapter six again there are two questions so We are discussing the seventh question over here that Arjuna is asking, and the way Krishna addresses this question. Actually, we will be discussing seventh and eighth questions also. The eighth question probably we will discuss in our next session. So here, in both seventh and eighth questions, Krishna acknowledges or appreciates Arjuna's underlying mood. There is a there is the letter of the question. And there is the there is the spirit there is the mood of the question. Question comes up in the question. There are the words, and then below the words there are the concerns. Now, of course, some of the words come, some of the concerns come through the words, but not everything comes out. So, this addressing the words, the questions is addresses the rational part. But people are not just not just rational creatures; they are also emotional creatures. So, a good teacher, a good answer addresses both the rational and the emotional part. So let's see how Krishna does that for Arjuna. The sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is called as is known as Dhyan Yoga, and this is chapter of Dhyan Yoga. When Krishna is speaking, he explains how this process of Dhyan Yoga requires two aspects. The yoga has there is there is austerity. It requires a lot of tapasya. Now there is the physical austerity of leaving one's home, going to a forest, sitting down in an erect posture, and meditating. And then there is the mental aspect. So the mental aspect is where one cultivates equal vision towards everyone. Suhrun mitra reyudhasi na madhyastha deshu bandhushu. Treat everyone equally. So now the physical aspect. Arjuna feels, yeah, it's possible. I have done this before. Arjuna has previously lived in the forest with his brothers and himself alone. He has performed austerities by which he has pleased the devtas like Indra and Shiva and got astras from weapons from them. But the mental part, Arjuna feels, it's impossible to see everyone equally. He says this. How can I possibly see somebody who is as virtuous as Yudhishthir and somebody who is as vicious as Duryodhan? How can I see them equally? That just doesn't make sense to me. So when he thinks like this, this is where he raises his concern, and this is addressed over four verses. So in thirty-three. 
and 34 is Arjuna's question. And in 35 and 36 is Krishna's answer. So here Krishna demonstrates, I'm talking about appreciation in terms of empathy. So Arjuna says that maintaining this kind of equanimity, yoyam yoga stoya prokta samyena madhusudana. That samyena, to maintain this kind of equality, equanimity, the steadiness of the mind. No pashami, I don't think it's possible for me. So, and then he says, why is it not possible? Because the mind is restless. Chanchalami mana Krishna pramathi palavadrudham tasyaham nigraham manye vayori vastu dushkaram. This equanimity is impossible for me because the mind is, he talks about it's restless, it's relentless, it's ruthless. It's reasonless. And because of this, it leaves us less. We feel less. I can't do this. So when Arjuna speaks this, the first thing that Krishna does, it is Asamshayam Mahabaho Manodur Nigraham Chalam. He says, Asamshayam, undoubtedly, it's difficult. So this itself acts as a big relief for Arjuna. Oh, yeah, it's difficult. Oh, it's difficult. Now, just suppose a teacher a student asks the question, you know, I find this very difficult. Uh, if the teacher says, you know, yeah, that's just because you're lazy. If you had only been more attentive, you would have found it easy. No, the teacher says, yeah, this is a difficult part. But you know, you don't try to understand everything right now. Just try to see what you can understand and build on it. If you have some specific questions, we can discuss later. So when Krishna says, undoubtedly, this is difficult, what he is, he is acknowledging and appreciating Arjuna's concern. See, a student could very well say, it's difficult, forget it. I won't study this only. Even if I don't do well in this particular paper, I would do well in some other paper and I will move on. If the student is actually expressing, yeah, this is difficult. That means the student is concerned about learning the subject. And the student feels, yeah, maybe this is difficult for me to learn. So the appreciation that is required, the appreciation can be that even the question, the hesitation indicates the students eagerness to learn and we can appreciate that eagerness to learn there's also the students courage in confessing the difficulty you know whenever somebody raises a question where they're actually i find this difficult it's so easy for that person to be uh, to be laughed at by other, you find it difficult. That just shows how foolish you are. Oh, it requires courage to express when they're confessing difficulty, they are actually expressing vulnerability. And this is something very difficult for most people to do. And if somebody is doing that, we need to actually acknowledge that. We need to appreciate that. To the extent we appreciate this, to that extent, the student can feel vindicated, can feel reassured. So first thing that Krishna says, Asamshayam Mahabaho Manodur Nigraham Chalam. He says that, yes, Arjuna, it is difficult, undoubtedly difficult. Oh, I'm not alone. I'm not foolish. You know, I'm not a loser in feeling that this is difficult. And itself gives a relief. Generally, when people lose confidence, see, most people don't lose confidence 
because they are unable to do some things. When there is loss of confidence, this is the concluding point. And one of the biggest characteristics of a good teacher is that the teacher should ensure that the student never loses confidence. When a teacher is speaking to a student, the student should at the end of the interaction feel encouraged, feel confident. I can do this. Yeah, maybe I have to work hard and it's not going to be easy. There is this mistake which often teaching involves, teachers involved. Sometimes people think encouragement means telling people that it's easy. Encouraging people doesn't mean telling people it's easy. Sometimes people feel, yeah, it's not easy, it's difficult. And I have to tell people about that. So if we think encouragement means uh, it, telling people it's easy, you know, that could be misleading. And we ourselves may not feel like doing it, but encouragement doesn't have to mean telling people it's easy. Encouragement means telling people it's doable. It may be tough. Hmm? Maybe tough. It may require a lot of effort, but it's doable. So what is the emphasis of the teacher? That is very important. And that emphasis very much comes out in the tone, in the mood, in the articulation of the student, of the, of the teacher. The same point can be said in the exact same point can be said in two opposite ways. So one way, for example, I'm going to this point now. Even though this is tough, it can be done. Even though this is tough, it can be done. On the other hand, the teacher says, even though this can be done, it is tough. So now, here what is happening is, the point conveyed in these sentences is the same. But in general, in writing, the principle is whatever is conveyed at the end of a sentence, that is what is remembered. And even though this is tough, this can be done. This is actually encouraging. Whereas, even though this can be done, it is, it is tough, this is discouraging. So it's important that we be aware of what we are telling people. So what Krishna does is, if you see Krishna's wording in 635 is this. Asamshayam Mahabahu. It's tough undoubtedly. But it can be done. And now specifically how it can be done, that can be elaborated afterwards. But we appreciate the student's difficulty and we appreciate that the student's concerns are valid. And then we move forward and explain. So Krishna is actually showing us the values of an empathic teacher, a teacher who understands and appreciates the concerns of the students. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. I discussed three main points about uh, what do we learn of Krishna as a teacher. We started by talking about here, our focus is not going to be so much on the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita as the mode of the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. So we will be going through the flow of the Gita, looking at, if you consider the zero point, if you want to say, what we are focusing on is the text, textual flow, to see how the needs of Arjuna are addressed and how the purposes of Krishna are pursued. That was what we are going to focus on. And in that connection, the first thing we discussed was using the acronym TEACH. So timing. 
So Krishna lets Arjuna speak till Arjuna himself runs out of steam. In adult education, relevance, the need for teaching has to be felt, the need for learning. So by 2.7, Arjuna is ready to become a student. I don't know, or at least what I know is less than is what I need to know. He accepts Krishna as the teacher. So instead of being too eager, you just pounce on students and dump knowledge on them, just wait for them to come to a point where they realize the inadequacy of what they know. And that will have, when we, the timing is right, the interest in the knowledge and the impact of the knowledge, both will increase. Then, E, I was talking about expansion. That when Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, his focus is not so much on dismissing what Arjuna knows previously, but on building Arjuna's vision, expanding his vision of his concerns. So Arjuna had concerns, say, for Bhishma. Bhishma's welfare, that concern was there. And what Krishna does is, yes, that concern is good. But the concern means there's a concern for the body and there is concern for the soul. So he says the body is temporary. The body is going to be destroyed, but you can help him to get a better body. So expansion means that we don't dismiss what the person knows previously, but rather we build on what that person knows. So just because we know about the soul doesn't mean we don't care for the body. We care for something more than the body. That okay, their soul is eternal and the body is like a dress. They'll get a better dress. So that was expanding or building on people's expansion of previous knowledge or previous concerns based on the knowledge that they have. So we build on that. And the last A was talking about appreciation. That when a student asks a question, at that time, the teacher needs to appreciate where the student is coming from and appreciate the eagerness to learn. Even if the child is saying that, oh, student is saying that I can't, I find it very difficult. Even acknowledging that I, this is very difficult shows that the student is trying to learn this and also has the courage to express the vulnerability oh I don't, I don't i don't think i can do this and in general appreciation means that our purpose in educating should be to make the person feel understood and encouraged okay yeah it may be tough but it's doable so encouraging appreciation means our overall tone should be of encouraging now, encouraging doesn't mean saying it's easy. That could be false. But it just means emphasizing that it's doable. It may be tough, but it is doable. So when we have this mood, then we all can move from in where whatever position we are in towards becoming more effective teachers. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Do we have time for questions? Yes, my Narsimha Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you very much for the uh, enlightening session. My question is this, as a teacher, Krishna, not just uh, taught the Vedic wisdom, the theistic wisdom in terms of uh, knowledge. He also uh, supported that by uh, showing his universal form, that is Pratyaksha Praman. So that's how we could see that Arjuna immediately became a transformed soul, ultimately, which is the purpose of the wisdom. But if you see in the contemporary scenario, there are teachers and students. As a student uh, myself, how I should look for my teacher 
along with uh, giving uh, only the theoretical knowledge, uh, wisdom, how I can relate with the practical realized knowledge uh, from my teacher. And at the same time, how I can present this to the newer audience, not just giving the theoretical part of it. Okay, good question. Hmm. So, two things over here. The question was that Arju Krishna demonstrated what he taught by showing the Virat Rupa. So, uh, how can we both expect from our teachers or give to our students this uh, realization? Well, we will come to the Virat Rupa in the next session. But since you brought this up, I'll quickly explain. But actually, Krishna does not rely on the Virat Rupa. You see, 10.8 to 11 is the Chatur Shloki Gita. Hmm? Uh, it is like a four-verse summary of the Gita. And after that, from 10.12 10 uh, 10 to 16, Arjuna actually confirms Arjuna says that Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Paramam Bhavan. That Arjuna says, in one sense, this is Arjuna's self understanding or Arjuna's conclusion that you are the supreme truth. You are the ultimate reality. And even in the 11th chapter, before he makes the request to ask that Krishna show the universal form, he says, Mohoyam Vigato Mama that by what you have spoken, my moha is gone. So in one sense, the questions after 10.15-16, they're all supplementary questions at the end of the class. So it is not that Krishna's core message depends on some supernatural demonstration. That supernatural demonstration of the universal form that is there That supernatural demonstration that requires mm, now not everybody can show the universal form but that supernatural demonstration it is not a central teaching it is a supplementary teaching the Arjuna is before how do you know it's supplementary because even before that Arjuna has said okay my, mo, my illusion is now dispelled so this is something which I'll be discussing in the last part. R is rational. Teach, teacher, when you talk about it, if you get to it. Actually, uh, the point is Krishna does not throw around, he does not force Arjuna to accept anything based on his divinity. I am God, therefore you have to obey me. That is not Krishna's mood at all in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna uses reasoned arguments to educate and elevate Arjuna. So, what could be the realizations that we expect? See, there is a supernatural visions or demonstrations. And there are, there is a natural transformation. The natural transformation means that each one of us needs to both be transformed naturally, naturally in terms of this world. In terms of this world, we will find that by the practice of bhakti, our impurities, our anger, our craving, our greed, all these will go down. Kama, krodha, moha, as is, or kama, krodha, loba. All these will go down. And if we see this happening, that itself is a good indication that the person is getting transformed. And similarly, our purities. Purity means that our attraction towards Krishna, our, it could be our devotion, it could be our selflessness, our concern for others, our capacity to express that concerns through concern through our how we act to take care of them. All these are demonstrations of purity. So if we demonstrate all these, we will definitely be growing in our bhakti. So that's how this natural transformation is what we can see 
we can look for in those who are our teachers and these are the transformations that we can also try to uh, manifest in our lives so that's how we can also become teachers who don't just give wisdom but also give realization okay thank you bro thank you so there are a few questions you already typed in the chat i'll take those one by one so now engage appropriately now in today's world where the knowledge becomes obsolete very quickly then in the it world for example and existing knowledge may not be relevant so then do we need to still talk about that principle yeah of course see there is that the specific knowledge that one has learned there is the capacity for learning hmm? see education has multiple aspects to it one is the content hmm, that is learned the other content to learn there is the discipline to learn that means discipline means okay i have had to learn this new subject i have to put aside all everything else every, every day i have to study 3 4 hours for the next one month i'll be able to complete the course and then beyond that there is a mood to learn so yes the content keeps changing and sometimes the older content may not be relevant but the discipline to learn if somebody has they studied a previous uh, computer some software language software skill and now they have to learn something new the fact that they had learned something in the past indicate they have the discipline to learn they can apply themselves and they can learn so in every situation one can look at what is deficient and highlight that or we can look at what is present and highlight that so that's what the ongoing learning don't disturb people's mind it means yeah you have, we, as i said it's not being unrealistic it's not being giving people false hope it's tough yeah what you have learned in the past may not be relevant but that does not mean that what the fact that you have learned in the past is not relevant the content may not be relevant but the discipline that you have got is relevant okay Mm. yes yeah, this will be uploaded on youtube now the needs and purposes i talked about arjuna's need arjuna's need was for reassurance what was krishna's purpose in the teaching of the gita i'll explain that in the next session now okay if someone is not open to the teachings of the gita due to misconceptions how can we inspire them to learn the right message well the message of the gita is very broad we shouldn't reduce the gita's message to certain bullet points oh that this is you are not the body of the soul there is only one god and that god is krishna so there is a lot to the knowledge of the gita and everybody is at a particular place so some people can approach the gita from one particular point others can approach the gita from another point somebody else can approach the gita from another point so instead of thinking that we just have one script that we want to download on everyone we need to understand the multifacetedness of the gita's message and see where their present interest and the gita's wisdom where do they intersect so that everybody has some interests and the gita's message that it requires us to observe people carefully and see if somebody is a parent and they want to be a responsible parent then we can talk about how the gita's message contains values that can help a person to understand how to appreciate the psychology of the child how to understand that the child is not just their child the child is a evolving soul who has come from a previous life and that they need to build on what the child has got from the previous life not just impose 
uh, their own ideas of how the child should be. So, the, so depending on the present interests of the person, the present needs of the person, that aspect of the Gita's message that is relevant for them can be emphasized. That's how things can be grown. Okay. Now, there are a few other questions. We'll take maybe two more questions. Yes, Priti Rupani Radha Devi. Prabhu, Hare Krishna, Dhanavats Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu, uh, it was a very, very uh, clear and wonderful session. Thank you so much, Prabhu. And also, uh, my doubt was, um, how can we motivate? There are people who come for Bhakti Rikshas. They have interest to learn and they're open to learn also. But how can we motivate them to um, apply and also stay committed? Because knowledge is one part. They come to learn Bhagavad Gita. Uh, but it is also important for them to understand that there is something that we need to put in practice for which we need to stay committed. So uh, when this encouragement part came, I was wondering how to really help them. Because they've come halfway ready to listen. So kindly uh, advise Prabhu. Yeah. Now, if we consider Krishna is the center of the Bhagavad Gita in the sense that Krishna is not just a teacher, but ultimately Param Brahma Param Dhamma. It is Krishna who is to be ultimately attained. Arjuna surrenders to Krishna at the end of Gita. Now, there could be different pathways by which people come toward Krishna. Now, I just mentioned four. There could be many more, but these are four broad categories. Some people come from the cultural pathway. That means that they come because they, they like the culture. Okay, do some kirtans. You know, we can practice some rituals. There's a nice atmosphere in the temple. Some people may come from a philosophical pathway. They have some questions. They seek wisdom and they're getting those questions answered. Hmm. Some people may come from more from a social pathway. That means they want, they, they want to hang out with good people. Now, okay, these people, they are spiritual, they are polite, they are courteous, they are helpful. Yeah, I like to be with these people. Some people may come from more from a psychological pathway. That means they feel the world is too much of an agitating place. I just want some place where I can be peaceful, where I can be calm, where I can gather my bearings back. So, in general, if we look at people and talk with them, we can understand which pathway they are coming from by what they appreciate the most. Hmm? Yeah, okay, what inspires you to come here? What they appreciate and what absence they, if something is absent, what they criticize or what they complain, if something is not there. By these two things, we can understand some, when something is present, they appreciate it. When something is absent, they criticize it or they complain about it. By this, we can understand which pathway they are coming from. And the pathway that they are coming from, that is the pathway they are most likely to want to contribute to. So if they are coming primarily from the philosophical pathway, then we encourage them to become future teachers of this message. We share this with someone. We share this with colleague, your colleagues, with your relatives, with your friends. And then what, what support do you need for sharing this? You can say, you know, if you want to formally teach, then it's good if you're practicing this also. And then you could be chanting some Hare Krishna mantra or whatever. We encourage them go along that pathway. If somebody is coming from a social pathway, it's like to hang out with people. Then if there are festivals like Janmashtami or whatever, then, you know, we, in our festival, we need somebody who greets and warmly welcomes newcomers. And that's the service they would like to do. If we tell them to come, oh, you know, can you come and do deity worship? Or you'd make this garland for the deities. They may or may not be interested. But if they're into social, they would like to, they'll be very careful we're welcoming guests and very attentive and polite. So we have to find what is attracting people toward Krishna and then facilitate them on that path. And as they become more and more connected and attracted on that path, over a period of time, as they come closer and closer, you know, they will become attracted to other aspects of Krishna also. Krishna is all attractive, 
but initially that attractiveness all attractiveness manifest through one particular man particular feature facet so we need to find that and attract them accordingly and gradually other things they will take up yes ye yeah, jn subramanyam ye vn subramanyam hari krishna prabhu ji dhanavat pranam prabhu ji thank you very much for a wonderful lecture prabhu ji it's uh, i've been uh, hearing your lectures for quite some time now and wonderful uh, wonderful prabhu ji thank you very much uh, prabhu ji i have a small uh, question uh, in the flow of bhagavad gita i heard uh, that uh, krishna initially chastises uh, arjuna uh, saying that you're talking like a learned man and then of course uh, he gets into the groove and then encourages him as you rightly pointed out prabhu ji so is that is, is that mode of giving a shock treatment like what we do with our kids sometimes is that also a good way of teaching prabhu ji or uh, what 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 is the recommended path thank you prabhu ji yes this arjuna give a shock treatment to arjuna at this uh, krishna give arjuna shock treatment to arjuna at start of the gita well again it depends on what you emphasize so if we consider 2.11 every commentator of the bhagavad gita has a particular mood and they will comment from that perspective so if you consider 2.11 ashochan anushochastam pragnavadam shya bhashase gatasun gatasun shya nanushochanti pandita that you are lamenting for that which is not worthy of lamentation and you are while you are speaking learned words the emotions that you are expressing are ignorant now this could be seen as chastisement and yes there is certainly an element of chastisement in it but at the same time if you see the overall context krishna does not dwell on that chastisement for too long sometimes a person when they start chastising they have they have 15 minutes to answer a question and 10 minutes they are chastising the person itself what a foolish person you are think you are so clever you see in the 700 verses of the bhagavad gita krishna speaks about 550 verses out of that it is just one verse immediately after that he is saying that okay now let's let's begin and he focuses not no oh, no no one here is going to die everybody is going to live here forever so even if the chastisement is there it's extremely brief so it's not at all a prolonged as they say it's not a is not haranguing the person it's not a harangue or a tirade where the person is meant to feel belittled and yes of course there are times when chastisement is required and we will discuss that in one of in a, as a part of our next session but the point is that overall the emphasis is not that you are a fool emphasis is that let's learn now so that emphasis is very very important if we emphasize too much that people are fools then either they may resent us the chastisement goes for too long there are multiple things which may go wrong by that one is they resent the teacher or they reject the subject itself you no know, this is too difficult this is too either this teacher is too harsh so i don't want to learn this or the subject is too difficult that's why i don't want to learn it now jiu goswami in the same words when he gives a commentary he takes the same verse and he focuses on the first word ashochan and he he connects this with the last word that krishna speaks ma shuchaha the so shuchaha and shochan have the same root and he says the whole purpose of the bhagavad gita can be encapsulated 
in the first and the last instructive word that Krishna has spoken. Ashochan, the first word is not worth lamenting. Ashochan. And Mahashuchaha is don't lament. He says this indicates that the purpose of the Gita is to free us, free the world, in fact, from lamentation. So it's a very compassionate purpose. So yes, chast chastisement may be required, but the overall emphasis has to be of encouragement. Okay. Yes, Kapil Pohani. Hare Krishna, Pujit Dhanur Pranam. Am I audible? Yes. Hare Krishna, Pujit Dhanur Pranam. Thank you so much, Roji. Roji, I wanted to ask, in one of your lectures in Pune, you mentioned that uh, you had a meeting with His Holiness Adhanath Swami Maharaj in America, and then you asked Maharaj that I'm not deliberately intellectual, but uh, I'm like that only. So Maharaj told you that uh, you just have to increase your concern for the audience. So I just wanted to ask that how you contemplated on that topic and in instruction and how you means how one how one teacher can develop more concern for the audience or the student. Okay, how, um, how can a teacher increase the concern for the audience? Well, I think there are mm, three ways to show concern. One is ask. Now we ask, okay, what was, what, what did you, what if somebody asks, it was a good class. Okay, what did you like in the class? So one is ask the students themselves, ask the audience basically. Hmm? What did they like? What did they not like? Especially there are some people in the audience who do give candid feedback, I mean, very few, but those who give their help, they're helpful. Then we can also ask the organizers. Hmm? And often the organizers, although they will be respectful, if but if we have a if we have a genuinely learning mood, if we have a mood of serving, then they they are all they also want to know. Okay, this is what this speaker is good at speaking, and this is what this audience needs. Generally, when people also organize some programs, they can they they try to find how they can find the uh, how can they can match the audience with the speakers. So I think being open to learn is what is very helpful. And then lastly is ask ourselves. And we say ask ourselves means that if we give some time for introspection, for looking back at what we did and what we could have done better, the Paramatma is there in our hearts and the Paramatma can guide us. Okay, this is what I did. Could I have conveyed this in point in a slightly different way? They could could have, could this have been better? So we do these three things, and I feel it helps. And of course, I would include in the organizer. I would also include our guides. We have our shiksha gurus. We have diksha gurus. Whoever are guiding us, we talk with them. Now they may not be attending our classes all the time, but they also do get some feedback about this or that, and they learn from that. They may tell us certain points. So in general. A teacher should not be thinking that my only purpose is teaching. A teacher may know the subject, but there is teaching the subject, which is only one part of teaching. But and that is what the but there is also learning how to teach the subject. And that is something which the teacher has to keep doing constantly because the audience is different at different times. The audience comes from different backgrounds. And that's why if we have that mood, then we all can learn and improve. Thank you for that question. Hare Krishna. So, shall we stop here now? Shanta, I think you already asked the question, isn't it? Uh, Guruji, children is first, yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, no, I have not asked. Uh, my one question is, 
that when arjuna was knowing previously that war is to be waged against his very own relatives so why only at the onset of war he realizes that yes that's because the gravity and finality of the war registers in him at that point see it's one thing to know that i have to fight against my relatives but it's quite another thing to actually go on the battlefield arjuna has fought against the same army more or less earlier at virat but at that time he had no intention of killing anyone he defeated everyone he wounded everyone slightly and they fell back but now it was not uh, that option was not there one side was not going to go back alive so that gravity and finality registered within him very heavily that's why when he came in the middle of the battlefield and he saw that both sides are my relative this is a fratricidal war so that's when that do i really want to fight this that question came within him so the bhagavad gita actually presents a situation where good people have no good options this is one of the big most difficult situation to be in life that that arjuna was a good person he was a noble person he was a principal person and now fighting was a terrible option but not fighting was also a terrible option fighting means killing his relatives but not fighting means that people who were demoniac people who were so brazen and shameless that they had tried to disrobe draupadi in public in the royal assembly they would get unchallenged power so that is also not a good option so what does one do when one is in a situation like this so that's why even good people have no good options when that registers on them na cha pashyakno me avastha tum bhramati vacha me mana nimittani cha pashyami viparitani keshava so that registered in arjuna in a extremely consequential way and that's why you say i just don't know what to do at this time so that's the start of the bhagavad gita Thank you very Thank much you. for your many thoughtful Thank questions. You so much. Hare Krishna.